we'll continue our series on the Bible, how God gave it and how we ought to receive it. And uh, we're still in this section of history, giving a timeline of uh, how God brought us the scriptures. And just a quick review, we spoke about that earliest tabernacle period when Moses wrote the five books, uh, the first five books of the Bible, and put them with the ark in the tabernacle. Then we saw the first temple became uh, that place where the scriptures were kept. The scriptures were preserved, even in the exile. Then they built the second temple, and that again became the central repository for the Old Testament scriptures. And we talked about the intertestamental period and uh, all the events that took place uh, there. And now we're looking at the New Testament uh, scriptures. And we're going to look at uh, how God brought these scriptures in three different phases. So the first phase we spoke about last time, how Jesus directly uh, orally taught the apostles. And that close, you remember, the uh, intimate relationship between uh, the teacher and the students that we see in the New Testament. So that Jesus transmitted to them everything that they needed to know uh, in order to form the doctrinal foundation of the churches. And then the second link is those apostles in turn wrote down the scriptures. They taught during their lifetimes, but uh, for the time when they would die, they wrote down the scriptures. And we now have a written record uh, that contains all of that authoritative apostolic doctrine. And then the third link is uh, the churches in turn propagate the scriptures in the world. So uh, they copy them, they translate them, they expound uh, them publicly and reach the world with this message. And so we've already spoken about that first link. Now we're going to in embark on looking at the second phase when the apostles wrote the scriptures. But first we have to uh, fill in a little bit of additional history after the Lord uh, uh, rose from the dead and appeared to his uh, church and ascended into heaven. Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, hanged himself after betraying the Lord. So we know that uh, among the twelve that Jesus picked there was this betrayer. And Jesus knew all about that. Uh, but Judas ceased to be one of the twelve. So that's why you see references to the 11 for some time. And Matthias was chosen as Judas' replacement. You see that early in the book of Acts. So now the 12 uh, is restored to that number, 12. But then also Saul of Tarsus, who was a Pharisee and one of the church's fiercest persecutors, was miraculously converted on the road to Damascus. He was the one that was actively hunting down these early Christians and uh, causing them to blaspheme. And now he's going to become one of the foremost witnesses of Christ. Uh, Saul became the Apostle Paul. Um, and he was sent by the Lord to the Gentiles. He's, uh, the Lord told him uh, that he's sending them to the Gentiles to open their eyes to bring them to light from darkness. And then he was baptized by Ananias, who was a disciple there at Damascus. Paul spent three years in Arabia uh, after that. We read that in Galatians. Then he returned to Damascus and then went to Jerusalem. And he spent 15 days there with Peter and James, the Lord's brother. And then he, after that, preached in Syria and Cilicia for 14 years. Uh, again, he gives us this timeline in Galatians. Then he went a second time to Jerusalem and met with Peter, James, and John. And this is important. They approved the message that Paul was preaching. So he went to Jerusalem and checked out his gospel with them. And they said, yes, this, is, this lines up with what we've been teaching. This is the true gospel of Christ that you are preaching. We read that in Galatians. And when James, Cephas, that is Peter, 
and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, that is the Gentiles, and they unto the circumcision, that is the Jews. So, uh, even some there of the twelve approved of Paul going to the Gentiles. And that was his ministry. The Apostle Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. He uses that title for himself in Romans. And how is it that he is an apostle? Well, he saw the Lord Jesus personally. He tells us that in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, and last of all, he was seen by me as one born out of due time. He said it was a little different than with the 12. But I saw the Lord too. And uh, not only that, he received the gospel that he preached. He said, not from men, but by revelation of Jesus Christ. The Lord instructed him in this gospel. And that's what he went preaching. And yet it was also recognized by those other apostles as being authoritative, his teaching, his gospel. And we know that Paul went on to establish numerous churches throughout Asia Minor and Greece. And he also wrote many letters to these churches which came to constitute one quarter of the New Testament. So the Apostle Paul is a very central figure in the writing of the New Testament. So uh, we want to speak about three different concerns regarding the New Testament. Uh, first we want to look at the authorship of the New Testament. Then we have a few comments about its composition, some of the unique features of its structure. And then lastly, we hope to be able to speak this morning on the dating of the New Testament. When was it written? But first, the authorship. And really, we have to begin here speaking about the authorship of the Gospels. That is uh, kind of the central uh, concern about who wrote the New Testament. Uh, there's a, a common thinking in the academy today. They say, well, these Gospels were just... Uh, anonymous writings that we get, were passed around for many, many years, and then finally people just made up some names and put them on them, and then they became Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Well, that is not true, uh, and there are reasons we know that that's not right. First off, in all the manuscripts we've ever found, either in Greek or in any other language, they unanimously attribute these four Gospels to their respective authors, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. If they, if they were uh, attributed later to these writers, there would be some variation. How would you, I mean, these, again, these writings are being scattered all over the, uh, around the Mediterranean and throughout uh, Judea and Galilee. How could you just simultaneously attribute them all to these? They just happen to be these four lining up exactly with what we know. No, this is a proof that these attributions go back to the very beginning because that's who, they were known to be written by. And think about this, that the, uh, having distinct titles would have been very important early on. Because we know that there was more than one gospel circulating among the churches. And if you're going to make a reference to that, what would you say? Gospel A, Gospel 2. You'd have to say who, whose gospel it was. You'd have to say the Gospel of Matthew. I'm going to read from Mark's gospel now, and so forth. So, even from the very beginning, it was important for them to have these distinct titles. And that's another argument that shows us these were the men who wrote the books. And this is another important evidence. False attribution to non-eyewitnesses would have been unlikely. Now, what do I mean by that? If you had these anonymous writings circulating around and some people just wanted to give them a stamp of authority, why would you pick Mark? Or why would you pick Luke? These are, as far as we know, people who may never even seen the Lord. Why wouldn't you say, this is the Gospel of Peter? Or this is the, the Gospel of Thomas? Or even, this is the Gospel of Jesus? But they just pick these unlikely subjects. That's because the, uh, the only reasonable uh, explanation is that they're the ones who wrote them. That's why they're attributed to these men, because they were the ones who wrote them. Uh, 
And finally, early Christian writers, uh, they also unanimously attribute the four Gospels to their traditional authors. There was not confusion on who wrote these Gospels. It was, again, widely unanimously known from the beginning. So who are these people who wrote the Gospels? Well, the Gospel according to Matthew, obviously this was written by Matthew, the Apostle Matthew, one of the twelve. And you remember we said that he was a tax collector. That was his trade. And uh, as such, he was likely literate in Greek because uh, that was the language of trade in those days. And for him to collect taxes, it seems it would almost require him to have been able to read and write in Greek. So uh, that one is, a little, is pretty straightforward. The Gospel according to Matthew was written by that Apostle Matthew. But what about Mark? Who is Mark? This was written by John Mark. And this is uh, someone that we're introduced to in the scriptures. The Gospel according to Mark was written by this man, John Mark. How do we, who is John Mark? Well, we, we first read of him here in Acts chapter 12. You remember that Peter was miraculously released from prison and he comes, uh, he comes to the door and uh, you know, at first they didn't let him in and so forth. This tells us where that took place. Acts chapter 12, verse 12, And when he, that is Peter, had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. So there was this man, John Mark, and his mother's house is where the disciples were meeting. Uh, after this also, it says, And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem. When they had fulfilled their ministry, they had come down to Jerusalem. And they went back and took with them John, whose surname was Mark. So not only was John Mark's mother a, a disciple who housed the, uh, the early church, John Mark himself was a disciple. And he went with Barnabas and Saul. We also read this a little bit later on. There, John Mark was the occasion of this contention between uh, Barnabas and Paul. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought not good to take him with them who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. And the contention was so sharp between them, between Paul and Barnabas, that they departed asunder one from the other. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus. And Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. So evidently, early on, there was this uh, incident where Paul thought John Mark uh, not trustworthy to bring with them on this journey. We don't know the details. Barnabas was also likewise convinced that he should come. We do know later on that uh, we'll see Whatever this rift was, it was reconciled between John, Mark, and Paul. Um, we read here in some of Paul's letters references to Mark. Paul says this, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, saluteth you, and Marcus, sister's son, to Barnabas. Now that Greek word uh, may also just mean cousin. doesn't necessarily mean nephew. Um, Touching whom you receive, whom you receive commandments. If he come to you, receive him. So that gives us a little bit more information that Mark was a relative of Barnabas. Might explain why Barnabas was more apt to have him come. Uh, but you see, Mark is there with Paul. In another place, when Paul's writing to Timothy, he writes this: "Only Luke is with me. Take Mark." And bring him with thee, for he is profitable for me, to me for the ministry. So Mark wasn't with him at this time, but he says, bring him. Bring Mark to me. He's profitable. So evidently, whatever that rift was early on, it was, it was healed. And John Mark became profitable even to Paul. And uh, also, uh, there are some with Paul who are saluting Philemon. There salute thee. Epiphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers. They're laboring and working with Paul, and they also send greetings. And there's one other connection that's interesting. There's also a connection to Peter, because we read in 1 
Peter 5, the church that is at Babylon, elected together with you, saluteth you, and so doth Marcus, my son. Now, Mark was not Peter's biological son, but he's speaking of him in the faith. He was a close uh, associate with Peter and important to him and beloved by him. This is the man, John Mark. And so uh, from this, as we said, John Mark was an associate, not just of Peter, but Paul, both of them. And early Christian writers say that Mark's gospel that he wrote down reflects the teaching of Peter and his perspective. So that's why we understand that Mark is giving us uh, kind of his source was Peter. Okay, well then that brings us to Luke. Who is this Luke? He is not one of the twelve. Who is he? Luke, that's his name. Um, but we read about Luke. We already read in Colossians. We read this, Aristarchus saluteth you, and Marcus, and Jesus, which is called Justice, who are of the circumcision. Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Paul's writing this in his letter to the Colossians. And so we see here, Luke is a physician, beloved to Paul. But also there's one other little clue we read here. He says, these are the ones who are of the circumcision. And then he also mentions Luke. This seems to suggest that Luke was a Gentile. He wasn't included with those who were of the circumcision, who were Jews. It's not entirely conclusive, but it's very suggestive that he probably was a Gentile. In another place, Paul said this, only Luke is with me. Luke was with Paul. He said, take Mark and bring him with thee and so forth. And we already read in the, uh, the, the end of uh, Philemon, those who were with Paul, Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers. So Luke was a, a fellow laborer with Paul. And so from this, what do, we, what do we learn? Luke was a physician. Apparently he was a Gentile. He was an associate of Paul. And he was also acquainted with John Mark. Isn't that interesting? Basically, all the things we read about John Mark, Luke is right there with him or mentioned with him. And he's the one that wrote uh, the book of Luke. This is how he introduces the book of Luke. This gives us a little bit more information. The first few verses of Luke. For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. So what he's saying is people have already begun to write down the account of what we believe. And it was delivered to us from eyewitnesses. So he's saying, these were my sources. This is, the, this is eyewitness testimony. He says, it seemed good to me also having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order. So Luke wants to write an orderly account of what took place in the ministry of Jesus. Most excellent Theophilus. And uh, that word, that name just means a lover of God. It seems to be, from all we can tell, a, an individual person who we just don't know who it is, that Luke is writing to and perhaps was the patron of this gospel, maybe supported Luke as he was writing it. Anyway, it's addressed to Theophilus. That's another argument for why Luke is the, really the one who wrote it. If there was a, a dedication to a particular person, if you're writing it to this person, certainly a particular person wrote it and was known to that person. That thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. So that's what uh, Luke says about in his preface to his gospel. But then we also have this, uh, the introduction to the book of Acts. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus. Theophilus again. So whoever's writing Acts is writing to Theophilus. And he says, the former treatise have I made. He says, I've already written something to you. The gospel of Luke. Luke's already written his gospel and now Acts is the uh, the sequel, the second part. 
The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up after he, that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. I mean, that's a description of what was in Luke's gospel. Now, the fact that Luke wrote Acts also gives us some additional information about Luke himself. How's that? Well, in the book of Acts, we have these we passages. Acts is written in third person. So-and-so did this, he did this, he did this. But then there's a shift, and then the, the author of Acts begins to say, and we went here, and we did this. So whoever wrote Acts it begins to writing from the first person, and so evidently went with Paul in what he was doing. So from this, we, we see that Luke was one who traveled with Paul. And Luke's gospel was based on eyewitnesses, as we said. Um, the fact that Luke may not have been an eyewitness, is, uh, an eyewitness himself, we don't know. But he's definitely explicitly saying that he's basing his gospel on these eyewitnesses. And also, uh, the early Christian writers say that Luke's gospel reflects Paul's teaching and perspective. And so maybe he was kind of the unique source for that gospel. Um, and also, as we see here, Luke wrote the book of Acts. So that's the gospel according to Luke. It was written by this man, Luke. And then what about the gospel of John? That was written by the apostle John, uh, who was a fisherman, we know. Uh, James and John, his... Uh, James, his brother, the sons of Zebedee. And uh, some critical scholars have said, well, there you go. These fishermen were illiterate. How could they have written the gospel? They say they couldn't have written gospels even if they wanted to. But, of course, that's completely ignorant of what was going on at this time. Uh, we don't know that John was illiterate, first off. I mean, Zebedee seemed to be pretty well off. You'd need to have some kind of uh, maybe literacy to be in the fish market and do your business. But even if, even if John was illiterate, he may have used a secretary. And we know that was a common practice. You know, if someone can't write today, maybe uh, someone, uh, you know, uh, maybe they've lost their sight and they can't, uh, they can't write. Does that mean that they can no longer write a book today? No, 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 no. They can dictate. And so that's a possibility. John was the one who wrote this gospel. And John is the same one who also wrote those letters, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and also the Revelation. And we already spoke about the book of Acts, uh, commonly called the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, that was written by Luke. And it, too, was based upon eyewitness sources, the events described there. This is a very important historical book. It uh, tells us many important things. Um, but it's also, at least part of it, a first-hand account. Again, those we passages. So, at least in those sections, we're hearing from the man himself who was there. And then we also know that we have many, many of these letters of Paul. Who wrote those? Paul wrote those, uh, of course. I mean, he says that he wrote those. If you look at the beginning. So that's, he wrote several letters to different churches. Uh, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. He also wrote letters to individuals. 1st uh, and 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon. And uh, that brings us here to the letter to the Hebrews. What about this? This book is anonymous. It doesn't, it doesn't start with Paul. and It doesn't mention the name Paul in it. But it is possibly written by Paul. And most, uh, most people think he was, it was probably written by Paul. Now, why would you say that um, if it was left anonymous? Just a few little observations. People, you can make a stylistic argument that it's not Pauline. Uh, people can get very detailed. Um, some of those stylistic uh, observations are just not really definitive. It can be argued from both perspectives. But there are a few little hints, I think, that point to Paul. First off, he mentions Timothy. Know ye that our brother Timothy is set at liberty. 
And we know that Timothy was a close associate of Paul himself. Just so just the mention of Timothy makes us begin to think of Paul. Also, the writer of Hebrews says this, they of Italy salute you. Those who were there in Italy. Uh, and we know that Paul was at Rome. So we know that. That seems to point perhaps to Paul. And he says this, grace be with you all. That was the salutation of Hebrews. And that is the specific uh, signing off that Paul puts in all of his letters. And it's here too. That seems to be a pretty good indicator that perhaps Paul wrote this. And uh, also, this is interesting, if you look at some of the earliest manuscripts in Greek of uh, collections of Paul's writings, they include Hebrews along with them. So evidently, uh, many in the early church understood and believed that Paul wrote Hebrews. So, there are also other letters in the New Testament. James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and Jude. And, uh, you know, 1st and 2nd Peter, it's obvious who wrote those. Peter wrote those letters. We already mentioned about 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, how John... Uh, the apostle wrote those letters. Well, who are, who, who are James and Jude? Who wrote these letters? Uh, let's see the letter of James. The introduction says this, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so there are other, there are more than one James. There are two in the twelve, James the son of Zebedee and James the son of Alphaeus. So, which James is here? Well, it doesn't necessarily, necessarily narrow it down. Uh, we also know there was this James, the Lord's brother, that Paul mentions in Galatians 1. Was he one and the same with the, one of these other Jameses? Perhaps James, the son of Alphaeus? Some have thought so. Uh, it seems uh, probably most likely that it would, we could attribute this to James, the son of Alphaeus. Uh, but it doesn't explicitly tell us which James. Um, and then also the letter of Jude. The beginning of this just says, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. Now, if we knew who James was, <laughs> that would really help us. <laughs> but uh, uh, <clears throat> we know that there is uh, one, Judas was an apostle. But apart from Judas Iscariot, there was Judas, the brother of James, in Luke chapter 6. However, in the Greek, all that really says is Judas of James. So many interpreters now say that that's a reference to Judas, the son of James. That's a possibility from the grammar, but our King James translator supplied the brother of James because traditionally this James is under, understood, uh, this Judas has been understood to be the brother of James, the son of Alphaeus. And, but then there's another Judas. There's Judas, the brother of Jesus, uh, mentioned in Matthew and Mark. Uh, initially an unbeliever, apparently, because his brothers didn't receive him, but perhaps later became a, a leader in the church. Uh, again, it doesn't exactly narrow it down. Then that brings us to the book of uh, the Revelation. And uh, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's the title that's given in the first verse. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. So John wrote the book of the Revelation. So what can we say, summing it up, about the authorship of the New Testament? There is good evidence that all 27 books of the New Testament were written by the apostles or their close associates. And uh, if we count Hebrews as being written by him, Paul wrote 27.1% of the Greek words in the New Testament. So uh, about a quarter. That's a lot. But actually he's only second. Who wrote more than him? Luke actually wrote a little bit more, 27.5 of the words of the New Testament between his gospel and Acts. 
So between these two men, you have over half the New Testament. And they have that unique uh, Gentile uh, perspective or association. And these authors were guided by the Holy Spirit. This is something that Jesus explicitly promised them during his earthly ministry. He said this in John, These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. So he said, I've spoken these things to you because you need to know that, but later on the, the Holy Ghost is going to bring these back to your remembrance. And it was important for them to remember so that they could write them down. In another place, Jesus said this, How be it, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. So the Holy Ghost is going to be one that is teaching uh, the apostles and these disciples as they're writing. So they were led by the Holy Spirit to write these things down. But at the same time, these authors had access to sources, both orally. I mean, they could speak to people who saw the Lord, interview people, and uh, evidently had also had access to written sources. How do we know that? Uh, again, if you read that beginning of the book of Luke, he says, For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth an order, a declaration of those things which are surely believed among us. In other words, when Luke was writing his gospel, he says, there are other people who have put down an orderly account. So Luke, if you think he didn't have, he knew of their existence, certainly he had access to these writings and uh, may have drawn on them as sources as he's composing his gospel. There's absolutely nothing... Uh, in the, the doctrine of inspiration that would prevent the use of sources by these inspired writers. Um, and so one thing that becomes clear as you're reading the, the Gospels, these first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they, they parallel each other, don't they? Uh, you don't have to read very long to see that these, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are lined up uh, in a particular way that's quite different from the Gospel of John. And so we call them the synoptic Gospels. That means they have the same kind of perspective. They're looking through the same lens, and that's why they line up. Um, and actually there is this complex literary relationship between these Gospels. So you see, this is kind of a comp complicated diagram here, but what this is showing us is... Between these three synoptic Gospels, there is material that is in all three. But then there are also some material that is just shared by two of the three. Like there's some that only show up in Matthew and Mark. Or there's some that show up in Mark and Luke. Or there's some that show up in Matthew and Luke. And then finally, there's also a proportion of what's in these Gospels that are unique. There are things that are unique to the Gospel of Matthew. There are things that are unique to Luke and unique to Matthew among the three synoptics. And, uh, uh, of course, the reason that there's so much overlap is they're describing the same events, and they're, they're uh, no doubt had the same sources of the people who were there. Nowhere do, should we ever have the idea that these authors were independent. They were not. They were part of that community that was preserving what Jesus did. Um, so... Uh, but people, you begin to look at this and you start lining up Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, it, you see, you begin to ask the questions, well, who was drawing from who? And it's uh, difficult to say. And you say, well, who, which one was written first? That's also kind of difficult to tease out. Uh, nevertheless, there's these relationships between these Gospels. Um, most, uh, most New Testament scholars today believe in Mark in priority, that Mark was written first, and Luke and Matthew uh, had him as a written source as they were composing their Gospels. That's possible. The traditional view is that the Gospels were written in the order that we have them now, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Matthean priority that he wrote first, which, I mean, that would 
The fact that there are, is shared content doesn't tell us about the ordering. One other question is, uh, what about John? Why is John so different? <coughs> Traditionally, the explanation for that is that John perhaps wrote later and was intentionally supplementing what had already been written in the earlier Gospels. So he was giving his unique eyewitness testimony of things that had not already been recorded. Remember, he says, if the things that, if they're all written in a book, there wouldn't be uh, enough uh, room in the world to, uh, to hold them. Some authors did use secretaries. We know that. This is not just speculation because you come on Romans 16, 22 and you read this. I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, salute you in the Lord. Tertius wrote this epistle? What? I thought Paul wrote this. What he means is he's the one who's writing it down. Paul is the one who is dictating. Tertius is writing it down and Tertius says, hey, I say hello too. I'm Maybe, you know, some of them may have known him. He says, I'm writing this. Hello. And you also see uh, in some of the other letters, you see things like this in Colossians 4. The salutation by the hand of me, Paul. Remember my bonds. Grace be with you. Amen. He signs off. Why would he do that? He said, most of this other stuff was written by a scribe, but I'm going to write down this last bit. This is me, Paul. And he just writes... We have, we have this idea, and it seems to be supported by his scriptures, he may have had failing eyesight. Um, and so it may have been very laborious or difficult for him to write, but he was important for him to write this in his own hand. He's, and he just writes these short little things. Remember my bonds. Grace be with you. Amen. And then you also see some references at the front end of some of the books. Like this, the way the, the, the letter to the Philippians begins, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi. I mean, he's basically speaking of Timothy as if he's a co-author with this letter. Now, we don't know to what extent uh, that even, what that even means. At minimum, it could have been that Timothy was writing it for him or was with him and sending greetings. Likewise, we see things like this in 1 Thessalonians. Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus under the church of the Thessalonians. So sometimes you have these uh, associated names on the front end too. That may have indicated that they were used as scribes or secretaries. And these writings were to be circulated. And this is explicitly part of what was written. So in Colossians we read this. And when this epistle is read among you, Cause that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that ye likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. So you read what I wrote to them, and you show them what I wrote to you. So uh, from the very earliest stages, these letters are being passed around and no doubt copied and copied and sent to other churches. And uh, 1 Thessalonians, we have this. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the holy brethren. So take it and read it aloud before the church. And uh, here's another very enlightening uh, statement in this early period. This is from what Peter says. He says, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. I want you to see two things here. First, Paul, uh, Peter says, in all his epistles. So Peter ha knows of and has read not one, Apparently not two or three, but many of Paul's letters. This almost is suggestive that he's got a collection of Paul's letters, even at this early stage while Peter's still alive and writing. And he's approving of them and their content and, uh, and that it, this is of the Lord. So much so that, did you see what he did? He says, there are people that twist the other scriptures. The other scriptures? That means these collected letters of Paul, Peter views them as scripture. 
He's not afraid to use that word to refer to them. So even in the earliest days, it's not like they were writing these things down. And then later people said, oh, you know what? We, I think these should be scriptures. No, no. They were viewed just like the Old Testament. It, it, there was not this grand delay before they were recognized. But they were being written and people recognized them, understood them as being inspired. And that's why they were so precious. And that's why they were preserved and copied, even from the beginning. Well, we've... Uh, run out of time for this morning. Next time we'll pick it up and we'll begin to speak about the dating of the New Testament. When was it written? And there's a few things we can suss out here. All right, thank you for your attention.